זהו. זהו, אנחנו פה. Welcome. Welcome to Tuzamen. To another episode of Tuzamen. Hi, Tzili. We are here every week because we would like to enrich ourselves. We feel that we have to open our mind to new people and be inspired. Decided that you can inspire us. And you can take us what I call somewhere else. Especially for me. And that sentence will be clarified later. So, Tzili, do you want to introduce the... The Lubavitch, uh, we'll talk about it also later. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I want to introduce Lior. Lior lives in cars. Uh, he needs to take us to some place spicy. Yes, right. Lior, tell us what you do. I, what we know is that you're from a kibbutz in Israel. You're a chef and basically came the emperor of the, of the uh, spices. spices. Yeah. Uh, what I do, I think for, I, I have some debts to settle with bad food. That's why I'm on a long journey to make food fun and tastier. As somebody who was fed in a kibbutz by a bunch of angry Ashkenazi people uh, <laughs> who had some issues with, I don't know what, life and products. I they think it's my life long mission to, um, to, change, <laughs> to change the way people eat. But maybe we need to explain the everybody what does it mean because the, the kibbutz used to have a big dining room and everybody all the members of the kibbutz used to gather to get for the meals and tell them what you ate because it, and by the way another... it was like a Parisian restaurant uh, in comparison to my mother oh, you, when you. she did ah. a schnitzel or a steak it was like are you call this The sandal, the, the sole of the shoe, the sole of so the shoe. Thank you so much. Shoes. That's what it was. Yes. And when my husband met me and he ate at my mother, she asked me, how was the food? He said, interesting. <laughs> and then he said, can we go out for a minute? <laughs> and then he rushed to the, to the steakhouse in Square Dizengoff. By the way, we are yeah. both from Square Dizengoff. You are from the kibbutz. We'll have something to talk about. We are from Square Dizengoff. Square Dizengoff. The north of Israel, the north, oh. north, north. Like anyway, we are from Dizengoff Street, both of us. Yeah. My See, father I... was from uh, Tel Aviv, but um, they couldn't figure out what to do with him. There were no schools left that my mother, my <laughs> grandmother could bribe the teachers. <laughs> so he was uh, surfing at Hilton Beach and playing for the youth wow. of Maccabi Tel Aviv. Wow. Uh, never became a surfer or a soccer player, but he ended up in Pardes Khanna at the, oh. uh, at the school That's there. That, last, that lasted about 10 days until he got kicked out of there and they ended yeah. up sending him to the kibbutz to ah. his uncle. That's how he met my mom. But your uh, mom grew yeah. up in the kibbutz? My mom was born in the kibbutz. Her brother and two sisters, uh, my grandparents found and founded, I'm sorry, the kibbutz in 1938 or 39. Which kibbutz? Dan, D-A-N, Upper ah, Eastern Dan, Galilee. Ah, Dan, I have, yeah, I have uh, nephews. Yeah. Anyway, who were there? So like, anyway, yeah. I was born there um, into, uh, I think, one of the prettiest areas in the world. Yes. Right. It's, it's Toscany, but with Israelis. Yes. Right. That's kind of the <laughs> It best. It was a combination. And um, I was fed some very interesting, it was very one-dimensional. It was all gray and brown. It was, the texture was the mush. Food. Oh, the see. food, yes. Uh, but luckily for me, I mean, there was Kiryat Shmona next door, which had oh, whoa, uh, Kiryat Shmona. amazing, big city. Uh, uh, the big culinary scene of the region, you know, you get, uh, right. you know, Moroccan food and Tunisian and um, some other Eastern European, but at least you understand that there's hope for food. <laughs> we then oh. traveled, we, le we left to live in Italy for a year. Wow. Uh, so I was a year old and apparently ate a lot of pasta and some non-kosher products, which I think was the beginning of a, a better journey in life. And then, then moved back to the kibbutz, yeah? But then the, 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 those days, the parents, they didn't cook at home because everybody... No, so... So the how did being... they, what did they do with this? Because you had parents from all over with different tastes, with different... Uh, Uh, appetite and they had to settle for the kibbutz food like anything else in the kibbutz it was it's a very intriguing concept the concept is amazing the execution yes 
I don't know. I'm a great fan. I was married in a kibbutz and I'm a great fan of a kibbutz. We all like kibbutz. We all like kibbutz. I had an amazing childhood. I mean, I wish my kids would have part of what... I grew up in nature. I went fishing. I had a horse. I think, you know, and nowadays everybody is going foraging and Scandinavia made a whole culinary career. We went foraging as kids and it wasn't hip or cool or trendy. Um, but you know, we, the dining room to me is the synagogue of the kibbutz. Right. It's the, the get together place where people gossip, they eat, they celebrate, they, uh, Reform, they complain dance. about yeah. everything. And, you know, food wasn't the highlight, at least for us. We didn't have, uh, there was a couple of interesting dishes that I, you know, still remember in a good way. But for the most part, the rest wasn't great. I think what saved us was having the river uh, next to the kibbutz, the Dan River, Dan so river. we could go fishing. River, um, yeah. in Israel, river is like a... It's, you know, for Israel, it's a big river. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but with, uh, with trout and great fishing, and there's a trout farm in the kibbutz, so you start greening fish. And um, I was able to go and visit my uh, grandfather's family in Jerusalem and discover Tunisian food. So that was, again, a big highlight. But great childhood. The food wasn't the best. Um, did you complain okay. about the food? You personally, did you complain about the food? I, I don't think I was old enough to uh, have an opinion. Um, but... Uh, No, I don't remember complaining. I didn't know any better, I think. Only when we left at uh, the age of seven or eight, we left to live in Brussels. Huh. I think that's where things started falling okay. into. It's like, okay, there is seafood, there's ham, there's uh, amazing French fries with mayonnaise, uh, there's uh, my chestnuts. Yeah. Oh, to this yeah. date, French fries is mayonnaise. Very good. Uh, oh, Oh, yes. uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think that was that was great, and you know, um, filling the French fries like, with the ketchup, <laughs> right? Yeah. I, I I'm okay with ketchup. I'm not a, a ketchup yeah. hater. I'm okay with ketchup. I love mustard more than I like ketchup. But, uh, right. right. But yeah, I think that kind of over the years, you know, also Israel. I mean, you, you know uh, very well, wasn't a, a culinary scene. I mean, restaurants were. Quite simple, good food was at home. Right. Um, eating out was a waste of money. Why would you go out? That's, right. You right. don't need to go out. You invite people over. And I think in towards like the late 80s, early 90s, there was a, a bit of a shift thanks to, yeah, a lot of um, my childhood idols who became like the first chefs or fa faces in the forefront of the culinary scene and understanding that we always had great products. great produce, great protein, but the, the know-how or the, the culture was missing. Yes. And I think that's what uh, a lot of people brought back from abroad during their studies. Design became a thing. Restaurants became nicer. Hospitality. Right. Uh, that was wine. It bars, was wines, you know. Restaurant for the workers. It became like, yes. yeah, for Nova, leisure. Nova. Yeah. I, I borrowed a phrase from a friend that says that we always made wine and cooked for 5,000 years, but we finally got good at it. How did the, your family react uh, uh, to you when you said you're going towards food? Uh, well, I told you uh, when we met at first that my mom was in, I sat down with him, he was 1997, I think, and I said, you know, mom, dad, I, I want to be a cook, and I want to go to culinary school, and my mom was in tears, and my dad is my dad, I mean, he, he didn't have much to say, he said, as long as you're happy, I'm happy, but um, she quite quickly got back to her senses and said, if you're going to be a failure, we got to make sure you're a really good failure. Oh. And so we'll help you go to a really good school to become a failure, a fancy failure. That's and sick. so I enrolled into a pretty fancy schmancy cooking school in France and wow. spent two years there. And the rest is kind of history. So when you came out, you chose a, 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 like a specialist, no, specialty. <laughs> specialty? Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 I apologize. I'm a professor at Tisch at NYU. 
Okay. English came from talking to Chinese students. <laughs> <laughs> he speaks Hebrew and English. We both speak French in English, and that's how it sounds. I so tell them my French. Just... They believe me, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so you. Can... I I graduated um, after two years. I didn't really have a clue what's going to be next. You know, I I got a job. I have a European passport, so I was able to stay in, in France and get a job the next day and spent three years working in Lyon where I where I lived um, and um, and had a okay life life was good we're doing well cooking was interesting and there's always a woman involved in the story mm -hmm. so okay. she was a beautiful young Israeli woman who said you know it, it's more complicated her grandmother and mine are from the same village in Hungary in Transylvania. Her dad and my dad are best friends since the army. So happens that we started dating somehow in France. And she said, you know what we should do? I said, I have no idea, but I'm sure you're gonna let me know. And she said, yes, we're moving to New York. I was like, no, I have no desire. And she you said, oh yes, we- No, 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 we're just dating. And <laughs> so okay. I said, what don't you do for love? You know, I packed my bags and quit my job and got a job in New York. And a week before moving to New York, while driving on Kvisha Chof or God knows where, she said, we got to talk. In Israel. There was no, she said, we got to talk, which is the worst phrase that everybody can, you know. Uh, <laughs> and I said, this doesn't sound good. And she said, well, it's not that bad. I'm just leaving you. And... <laughs> My dad. And you can go to New York. <laughs> and I sat down with my dad and he said, well, listen, I'm not really smart, but the way I see it, it's a round trip ticket. So just go. And if you don't like it, come back. Right. He regrets saying that because I never came back. But, uh, uh, but you, you, I mean, we can talk about that. You know, it's a, fa a fantastic dad. You had my it. father is a very interesting character. Uh, you know, I went many years ago to cook for Robert Mondavi, the winemaker who made a very nice career for himself in the wine business. And somebody asked how he became so successful. He said, I didn't spend much time in school, but I have good common sense. Okay. And um, I think there's something about street smart and common sense right. and yes. uh, that I appreciate. I have nothing against You're education, don't get me wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, smart. Yeah, yeah, so I arrived here in 2002. Yeah. Okay, okay, go on. No, 2002, and, and yeah, since then have been living in New York. Oh, next uh, door. Yeah, right here. Yes. Next door. Yeah. yeah. I'm six months yeah. here, six months in Israel. So. Yeah, and Upper West Side for the last 19 years. Ah. Yeah. So you're both. Uh, uh, I didn't know that at the beginning. I came here and I thought it was, I didn't, at, at first I didn't belong. I didn't have a dog or kids. Ah, okay, okay. I still don't have a dog, but I have two yeah, kids. The kids. So, okay. Yeah. So tell me something. So when you finish school or after you work with this and this, did you choose, again, I'm going back to my word, which doesn't come right with me, special, speciality. Specialty. Yes. Did you That's eventually true. found your, your, uh, vocation your god mission no no right away i think it's you know it was it was a journey um and i think that's something and when we can talk about it if you want later on about my next big project in life which is already in route which is the culinary uh, institute in israel i went through a journey of like 20 25 spoiler. years I, this spoiler Go ahead. Um, I was fascinated by you before I even met mm -hmm. you. Is, is Kriyat Shmone. We'll talk yeah. about it later because I know the city. I, made, I make a film. Yeah. There. Anyway, we'll talk. So you came out. So of yeah, I 20, 25 years of, of cooking and baking and working in different restaurants, high pressure, no social life, uh, all good. No regrets whatsoever. I think at some point um, I was uh, assigned to be the uh, executive chef of Danielle Boulou's catering company, uh, which is like running a marathon every day and dealing with a lot of uh, stressed mother-in-laws and aunts and brides and uh, 1,200 people at the MoMA for dinner. And, and it wasn't for me anymore. And I went to see Danielle and I said, chef, um, I don't know what I'm going to do next year, but I'm out. 
he was like, when? I was like, well, I'll give you a year notice. How about that? And um, I, I loved every moment of, of working with Danielle and, and doing that, but I had to make a career change or, or some sort of a realization that I didn't want to have a restaurant. I didn't want to work in a restaurant. And that's when friends came back. I had a, a mentor a boss in France that is considered to be one of the, the biggest people in the world when it comes to spices and cooking with them. And I started thinking maybe that was, you know, maybe what that was the thing that I need to uh, pursue. And I went to, I flew and had dinner over there in Brittany, which is a magnificent place. And we had a chat the next morning and he said, um, I don't really need to hear about your plans. Why don't you just go and do them? Wow. What? And call me if you need anything. Which to me uh, remains a great testimony of, uh, of, a, of a mentor of saying, you know, I, it's, I've never been to therapy, not that I have anything against it, but yeah. no, uh, I don't see, I have my ways of, of dealing with, I, I cook, that's my therapy, or listen to music, uh, or do both. But I think to me, it was like a therapy session with him of him saying, I think you know what you need to do, just go do it. It's amazing. A sentence that we should all adopt. So you surround yourself with spices. It's, it sounds like a language, a you know, of a language of a taste and colors. And a, I can only imagine all the, all the jars around you. It's also How a metaphor. How do you play over that? But you know, it's also a metaphor because yeah. there are so many books now about happiness. Unbelievable how many books. And then look, yeah. spices. I think it's connecting senses. I have a, a really a need and an urge to do something with my hands to create. I, I sometimes will go home and my wife will like, so how was today? Did you do, what did you do? I said, I didn't do anything. She said, what do you mean? You've been gone for 10 hours. What, what do you mean? And I said, I haven't made anything with my hands. To me, it's a day that's uh, not so accomplished, I should say. So A, that was one reason to get not to leave the culinary world completely, but remain in an environment where I can create, use my hands, use my senses of smell and taste and visual, and, and then pass them along to somebody else who will take it from there and hopefully create a new story with it and transport them into a different place without going. Spices have that ability of transporting of the sense of scent, which we ignore completely. It's all recorded in this hard drive that is impossible to erase. And the moment you were somewhere and smelled something, it's, it's there. And, and how many times have you walked into a place or, or smelled the dish and it's something clicks in your brain? Um, to me, it's fascinating, this ability of, of connectivity through food, through smell, to scent. It's to me, unbelievable. To me, into a place like this, it's by the colors. Because I'm just, I, my world is color. So I would be probably in a place like this, organizing everything by combinations of colors, have nothing to do with <laughs> smell or taste, and just play, play with the colors and change it all the time as, you know, as, yeah. as I wish. I would, I would love to have you come and make blends based on color. I'm fascinated with okay. the concept. Okay. I'm, color, I'm colorblind. By the way, you know, I, I make salad by colors yes i don't Beautiful think so i i love it because all i all i care is for the combinations of colors and i make it uh, fun or interesting or the way i feel the same day that's it i have no clue about yeah. anything else but you know Nothing. i you know when when i uh, teach my students you know directing the actors just one part i tell them that one that they have to have a bag of tricks the director so one of the things is really to use what you just said, you know, tell your actor, if, if he doesn't react according to what your vision, if it fits you, tell him, do you remember how was it to come to the kitchen of your grandmother and smell it? And that's it, it may, no, they got it. You know, you it's can amazing. do it, you can give it a, a codes to feelings yes. and actions. You know, you can use chili, you can, there's something else you can use salt you can use pepper everybody will have a code of 
what correct how to characterize the behavior by the by the spice it can be very interesting but i really envy you in many ways so so we get don't worry but i always my husband if you talk to him you know i'm with him since i'm i don't know 19 he still can we're never single never actually no you're no. right <laughs> but but you know some of my our best friends they say ask cp what she like and she will say scrambled eggs and i was in the best restaurants around i really tell you you know i visit something to say the drive something was stuck in my drive therefore i asked you about the kibbutz because my mother was so terrible except scramble and, and you know chopped salad everything else was terrible and somehow i'm not open it's like you know like a stain in my brain and i wish you would inspire me to somehow open you know a path i can only try i'd be happy to i think that um I've met over the years a few people who were stuck on a certain type of cuisine or had like big dislikes. I don't like this. I don't like that. I am married to a living proof who was vegetarian on our first date. And that was nearly a big, big, you know, big thing for me. Um, and on our third date, um, after the appetizer, amazing restaurant that closed at Fedora, after the, the appetizer, she said, boy, this tomato and pepper stew, really delicious. I was like, this was tripe, uh, by the way. And uh, so from going vegetarian three weeks before that to eating tripes and thinking it was amazing, I have met her mother. And then everything was <laughs> totally clear to me why she was vegetarian. Uh, I think, you know, um, I'm not saying that there's, you need to like everything. I think it's important to explore and be open-minded um, and, and explore. Cooking is, is, is a lot to ask from somebody. The, the need or the will to go and cook, I don't think everybody should do it. We just, okay. Some people just don't have the need to go there, uh, but you still okay. appreciate food. Yeah, no, I, listen, it's... Yeah. Leo, let's say uh, somebody walk us through with a person that walks into your kingdom, not a chef, not a cook. What do you do? How, how do you present everything? What's going on? Uh, we have a sort of a spice therapy kind of session put in place where, uh, for, first of all, you walk into La Boite in Hell's Kitchen, it's impossible to stay indifferent. There's kind of, you get hit by a mixture of spices and the cookies we bake on premises. So uh, it, it would be interesting you as a filmmaker to one day just put a camera and record three months worth of, it, of expressions, right. of expressions of people's face like, and doing all these things. Um, and then some come with a purpose. They know exactly, yeah. they know the product, it's easy. Uh, for the most part, they're, they're in for an experience, which I find fascinating, that they wanna explore, they wanna taste, they wanna smell, they wanna tell me all their great stories. And um, I've been told that I'm a good listener, so that's fine too. And yeah. um, we try to walk them through what it is that they're for. Is it for a gift? Is it for themselves? How complicated they want to do it? What's their likes and dislikes? And um, yeah, it's it's fun to see. And and sometimes somebody walking in saying, "I really don't want to get any of this," and they obviously leave with all of the stuff that they didn't want to buy uh, because they realize that it could be different from what they know. Wow. So the fashion the fashion designer. I guess she's the expert. So when he designed, he compared colors to fabric, you know, stuff like this. So when you have to decide what spices to use, is it intuitively? Is it a result of research and or experience? I think it's both. I mean, the early years uh, were about teaching myself, I wouldn't say like how to walk, but Nobody ever taught me about how to taste, smell, and articulate. Yes. I think vocabulary is, is you know, in, in both what, what you do. I mean, we lack professional vocabulary, right. I think. But there uh, are some rules, what goes with what, right? Because, you know, when I first came to New York, I remember going to Fairway, and I used to walk, uh, follow 
uh, women that was, weren't Americans. I, I was just, and especially from the Middle East, I used to follow them and see what do they think? What do they see? What do they choose? I was curious because there were so many things that we didn't have. And I said, let's see what they take. And you know, these women that they think what to cook, how to cook, what to do. It just, they know what goes with what by their tradition or by whatever they learned. And I know that there are rules. This goes with this, this goes with this. this. I have no clue. I'm just trying. Yeah, but then they come to his place That's right. and they have to, what, well, this is this and this is this. So what the point? I think I taught myself a whole new language, which was smelling and tasting. And I think at a certain point, I compare it often to jazz musicians. That I think once you have the skills, you could start improvising. Great play, yeah. It's, it's improvising within a reason. And with and knowledge, I think, prior knowledge. But that's the combination. Yes. I think you have to get it. You know, I'll take it to your world as a cine, cinematographer or director. Um, I would take a non-educated guess that most good filmmakers, directors, whatever, or even screenwriters, or maybe not screenwriters, but have a good idea of, of how to look through a camera. Now, they don't need to be a, a, a photographer or a videographer for that, but they have the talent to tell somebody else yes. and be good at it. And it comes from a reason. And so for me, food is the same thing, but I'm happy that it's my point in life and the journey is far from being over. I have this freedom based on knowledge to yes. play around and, and I shop by feeling, you know, there's nothing that makes me happy as in go and stand in front of a, a full aisle of produce and, and see what talks to me at the moment and just grab something and start thinking, what am I going to do with it? But, but is this skill can be learned? I think, yeah, I think so. I think yeah, the- To some extent. To because some curiosity extent. is really a big part of it, curiosity. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, as I said earlier, cooking and, and probably other uh, professions, you need to want to do them. I can teach you as many possible skills and give you blending spices isn't complicated is two or three steps. You get a scale, you measure things, you toast, you grind. The, the mechanicals of it are very simple. You don't need to be a genius to do that. The, the um, creative element or thinking of what it will... I started cooking without food at some point in my career. Is is thinking without food? Cooking in my head. Okay. Uh, and and that was to me a really liberating moment of saying I can write a dish and knowing Amazing. pretty much what it's gonna be like. Amazing. Right. Amazing. You know that very much you mentioned you keep referring to visuals and films mm -hmm. and stuff. But you know, it's also, you know, when we write a screenplay, we have to actually think what are the cinematic elements which fit this moment and hence this dramatic bit, you know what I mean? So from the- it's, To me, it's fascinating what you do because I've seen a few screen, I'm, I'm by far no screenplay, but reading it and, and, and the, all the side notes of you'll say that, but at the same time, something will crash, fall. Yes. As you are looking at, uh, yes. it's like a war plan Yes, uh, but you have it in your mind first. You see, you have to see and hear right. at every moment. It's not just. But I would, I would say that even to the fashion world or architects, every uh, and in and every world. Yeah, but you see, people don't know that you can cook in your mind. It's amazing. People don't know many things, and you can create so much in on in so many areas, in so on so many levels, and. Uh, Many people are not creative, but the creative people do know. But emotionally, what, what is the most, the strongest effect uh, affects you emotionally when you come to, to deal with this, the spices? I'm sure that it brings strong emotions because it's, it's, the colors are strong, the smells are strong. Something is very effective. I think what drives me, one of the things that drives me is the food that's going to be cooked with it. I am not just a spice maker. That's right. my, my liability or my, it's not really liability, my responsibility is, is to that bite that whomever just ate 
whether I cooked it, whether somebody else cooked. I also need to, I try at least to think of the end yes. what consumer. Making, what makes the food? What will, what will they do with it? You know, yes. what will they, and it's to me one of the most rewarding moments when it happens is being able to eat somebody's food with, with a spice that I made here very selfishly thinking that it's good. What do I know if it's good? Maybe it's a disaster and, and having either somebody sharing a moment, uh, eating that food. Um, so there's, there's a really whole thought process of from here, what excites me and drives me is the, the food on how it's going to be. I, I, I don't like for people to just keep it in a jar and look at it. They, it's, it's a tool in the hands of, of, of the cook. But it's uh, the beauty thing, the beautiful thing about it, it's like, it's real art because when you make your piece, you really hope that it will get to the other side and it will keep serving them, whoever has it their way and then it, it close a whole cycle. And this is a pure art. And, uh, and I think that you have uh, the ability of looking at the huge picture and to have so many ingredients that it's not only the colors and the brush, it's really, where is it? Which wall? Right. What's next to it? In what house? What do they think? What do they feel? What do they wear? Where do they go? Who comes to see that? There's a whole different, like a big story with many sub stories in it. So maybe you can take us to your uh, dream school a Dream Place Academy in the in the kibbutz in north of Israel. It's a kibbutz next door to your kibbutz. It's not a kibbutz. Kirat Shmona is not. No, no, no. It's going no, to. No, the the yeah. school itself is next. Oh, right, 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 right. You wanted to do it, but yes. in the Kirat Shmona, right. right? Okay. Can you just before you go there? Um, I just want to know what will be the principle before you tell us of your training opening a school. You know, having students, it's almost like you carry them through a journey, and it's almost like um, I don't know vision, or if you can def somehow a little bit talk before we not go to open it. But that's the whole thing. You, if, if yeah, it's. I think they're connected in a way. The idea started in '97 when I left Israel from a, a pure, simple idea of saying, "Why would I need to leave Israel to get culinary education?" Um, there's only one option back there, which was Tadmo, which is a fantastic government-run school. Uh, I just thought it wasn't maybe enough for me, and I left. And pretty much since that day, every year, every couple of years, the idea kept coming back is, what can I do? I met, I don't know how many people from the private sector, from the nonprofit, and pitched them this idea. For the most part, they said, it sounds like an amazing idea. It's never going to work but we'd love to come and see it when it's open, which means nothing. And about three years ago, a friend in Israel, who is my uh, 1-800 number, I call her for every, if, if I need something, I said, Hana, who do we know? And so I called Hana and she's from the banking world. She has no, she loves food, but um, she said, I think I have a guy you could meet, this might be it. And I met with uh, Russell Robinson, who runs Jewish National Fund USA, for many years, I sent him to meet my dad at the orchard so that he kind of gets into the mood. And my dad gave him a, a little bit of his uh, uh, grappa that he makes from figs. So that helped kind of seal the deal. Mm -hmm. And then we, we set up a meeting on their, in their offices on 69th and Madison. And I walked in and he came and he said, well, okay, what, you know, what I, can I do for you? And I said, I'd like to build some sort of educational facility for food in the Galilee. He said, okay, uh, done. I was like, you gotta, you gotta explain to me uh, 20 what? years of, of refusal. What's in it for you? <laughs> he said, listen. I'm American, what is it for you, right? No, he no, said, he it's, I, know, I, ask, I ask Russell and he said, it's quite can... simple. Uh, my- it's food uh, when it comes to Israel. Israel is, the top priority for me and Jewish National Fund USA, we have a mission to bring 300,000 new residents to the Upper Eastern or to the Galilee across the board, Eastern and Western. He said, I am gonna exaggerate, but even if you walked in here this afternoon with the concept of a car wash or a circus, I might have funded as well. So it's not about, he said, I obviously like food, but to me, 
this culinary institute or the circus or the car wash are a beginning of a much bigger circle. It means employment, it means education, it means medical facilities. It's about creating, and JNF's big mission is not to take very generous donations from un incredibly generous people around the country and saying, here is something to help you. Not at all. The whole philanthropic world, the, the little that I know him for the last five years has switched to a, I compare it to a VC model in a way of, I, I'd like to see what's happening with my money, that it does something good. Right. To give somebody a tool, it's you want to be you want to be a good fisherman. Here's a fishing rod. Now go and fish, mm -hmm. so that you can support yourself. Right. And so we took this idea that started very small into what it is today. It's called the Galilee Culinary Institute or mm -hmm. GCI, uh, that will be built in Gonen, in Kibbutz Gonen, south of Kiryat Shmona. Our first study of the region, we sent some. Um, what is it called? The um, uh, facility in Erzelia, the uh, business school. Um, I'm blanking on the name. Um, there's, a, in the there's a business school, a Bentrum. Yes, yeah. thank you. Uh, I forget the name in English, but yeah. So we hired a group of graduates from there and said, let's, let's see what the region has to offer and what's the feasibility study as any good business should do. Um, and the head of that group, Reut, uh, came with a really in-depth study of the need and how it could be successful. And she said one thing that struck with me and still to this day, she said, if you don't open this place, I will hunt you down for the rest of my life. And I said, Reut, what, what? She said, I am from Tel Aviv. I've been to Kiryat Shmona maybe 10 times, driving through and through. I never stopped. Yeah. I sat with the most amazing people there were 50,000 people in the 60s and 70s. There's less than 30,000. And she asked a few of them, and they all said, we are here because we have nowhere else to go. And she said, if you don't do it, I will hunt you down. I promise these people that you're coming here. Wow. So you better. Uh, and um, so the idea of GCI is, is quite simple. We looked at the education system around the world saying, What's, is there something wrong with it? I think that the one thing that's wrong with it is that it's not vocational. It's too long. You're being taught a bunch of things that you will never use in your life. And there's no purpose and you don't celebrate the skills of the actual student. You try to apply a template, hoping that it sticks with the thousands of the millions. And I said, okay, that's a very ambitious thing to say. What can I, with the team, contribute? And we decided to do a 12-month program, uh, very intense and condensed, that will allow the students, the graduates, to experience for six months everything they can, from caviar making to cheese making, wine making, fly fishing if needed. I, I don't care at that point. And then sit down with us and say, what have we learned? What are you good at? What are you bad at? Let's let's push the good and put aside. If if you cannot cut tomatoes, there's no need for me to teach you knife skills. Maybe you're a good writer or photographer or a movie maker or fashion designer to make aprons. You know, people talk often about farm to table movement. I always say that nobody talks about the table. <laughs> nobody talks to the person making the table. How important is furniture, silverware, glassware, China? Yeah. It's, you know, sitting around an oval table or a rectangle, it's not the same thing. Eating right. from a nice plate or a paper plate. So there's so much more to the culinary world nowadays, luckily, not to mention food science technology. We want our graduates to be the next uh, leaders and thinkers in the culinary world globally because it's an international school open to the whole world. Uh, people who will have good skills in storytelling activism and, and leadership. And if we accomplish that. And they also, uh, the, the way you talk about it, it's really very important to pay attention to details. Absolutely, I think that. Uh, yeah, 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 but details. sometimes we forget because he, you see, we with him that he went to, you know, that whatever cook and then he, he spices, you know, he moves from one, and every time he talked about something, he is referring to the details. 
you know it's but like I the, think you know one of the one of the classes that I'm very excited about the details right. you have to have the details and it's like to have a good ingredients for the dish if you don't have good ingredients for the dish it won't come out well if you want to make it uh, beautiful uh, and uh, inviting maybe it won't be as successful as yeah. you know it's really it's all planned to the dot and it's beautiful will you have a restaurant there so the campus is uh, can um, consists of three buildings there's 20 rooms dormitories but uh very nice ones um there's an existing building where it's going to host the restaurant and auditorium uh cooking labs a vegetable butchering lab which is kind of uh, an exciting part for me is learning how to butcher vegetables um, a flour milling facility, learning how to mill grains and flours, oh, yeah. um, a pastry uh, classroom, that's all one building. Next to it, a brand new construction that will host a chocolate lab, so the ability to make chocolate from bean to bar, a coffee shop in a store, uh, a bread bakery, a pastry shop, and the whole second floor is a beer brewery and a wine bar. That, wow. That will be a community. And Absolutely. next to it, uh, a farm. So the GCI farm where students will grow the produce and then bring it back to be composted in a composting facility. Do you know, I don't know if you know because you grew up in a kibbutz, but in when we were kids, once a week when we reached, I think, sixth grade, uh, they took us to a farm to show us how they grow things. And they used to send us home with a cucumber, with a, with onion, right. with something like this. It was really funny, but it was like getting to know something a little bit, you know, for the yeah. city. And for also the kids, in the Shavuot, they put us to food. <laughs> yeah. you know, I think in element in the first we had a wonderful teacher and we did it on the balcony. We had a balcony in our teacher. class. And uh, and every Friday we had something that we planted. So it's really, it's really beautiful. But do, are you going to allow other communities like the Druze, the Arabs, to bring their herbs and uh, products so, and uh, yeah. So the reason we chose the Galilee, which on paper doesn't make much sense from, you know, um, distance from the big cities, uh, et cetera, was on purpose, aside from the fact that I'm biased and I'm from there, so it was important. It's really to showcase the unbelievable um, complex ethnicities and complexities and right. cultural, uh, where you can have a Druze cooking class at the same day that you're gonna have a Christian or Bedouin one, or, or, uh, or a Lebanese one, all within a mile to two miles distance. Right. We are there to celebrate this. Uh, I joke that it's Israel is probably second just to Queens in diversity. Right. Um, you can have in one building 50 or 40 different ethnicities living in Kiryat Shmona in the region. There's nowhere else that you could do that. And that's part of the reason we chose the Galilee and uh, have People come attend the school, come and teach at the school, just come and enjoy it uh, and be part of this GCI community that we're committed to become part of it as the new neighbor in the neighborhood. And, I and so, really, you know, I really wish, so we always say that one of the characterization, how do we characterize a character in a movie or is what he surrounds himself with. Mm -hmm. And here you are, and I always, you know, tell my students, I don't want to cut to the book. I want to see you with the Lubavitch behind you. And there is a dialogue here, which I have to produce now for myself. But because we talked about food, or maybe even in our conversation, there are some seed planted that the payoff will be now you telling us your story with the Lubavitch. Your, your partner. dialogue. Uh, your partner. Yeah, you I grew up. I grew up as a secular Jew in the kibbutz. There was no synagogue. There was no, we celebrated holidays as a cultural. Yes. And I, you know, you, you know that. No, yeah. You made your own It was not the Agada that, you know. <laughs> no, 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 definitely not. And, um, and I think, you know, Judaism to me, nobody asked me. I was born Jewish. I was born to a Jewish mother. It wasn't an elective thing. It was right. given. 
And only later on, I think when I moved to France as a student and even more so when I moved to the US, I started thinking of what it means to be Jewish because in Israel, I, it wasn't a question, you, you're just there. There were the holidays and everybody celebrated them in That's one right. way or another. Uh, and moving to the US, I was like, who are these weird people driving to temple on Saturday? <laughs> And then I, it took me a minute to say, well, A, who are you to judge them for doing it? You don't even go to temple. And um, so I, you know, to me, Judaism is, is very, it's a state of mind. It's, it's, uh, it's a culture. It's a religion, of course. Uh, but I think the beauty for me is that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dialogue between whomever you want and yourself. I have an issue with the intermediate people. I yeah. think there's a lot of too many interpretations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they yeah. say in Hebrew, Tzadik be'emunato ichyeh, you do what you feel or believe to be right, and, and whatever the consequences are. Um, I have great respect for all religions, yeah. Judaism, Buddhism, Islam, it doesn't matter. Uh, whatever it is that you want to do, I'm, I'm fine. I support that. Somebody gave me this. A uh, photo is these two unbelievably funny um, Chabad Nikim who come here every Friday. We have great chats about Parashat HaShavua, what it means, the story behind it. Yeah, the weekly uh, chapter that you read from the Torah until you complete the cycle. Um, they ask me every time to put fill in. I always politely say no. Um, it's been... About 36 years since the last time, I think I put it since my bar mitzvah. Yeah, bar mitzvah. Did you bar mitzvah? Did you uh, bar yeah. mitzvah in the kibbutz? No. No, in the Rehovot. In the kibbutz. We, my do. parents left at some point, the kibbutz, and I left with them. So we lived in Rehovot and then in Kochav Yair for a while. And then uh, nice place. I came back to the kibbutz by myself. Uh, but yeah, I saw, listen, I, I think. You know, we get along well, um, and uh, it's it's fun. And as a parent now to two young kids, uh, the, the question in my mind comes quite often of, of what it is that I want to share with them, especially since um, they live here, they don't go to Jewish school. I speak only Hebrew with them, but they answer in English. Um, we try to do some things that I feel comfortable. I light candles for Shabbat. Uh, they have grape juice. It's a three-minute uh, operation uh, or ceremony, and and that's it. And they like it, and it's fun. And we do the holidays, and uh, we did Passover for the one of the first times this year where they actually sat down and they read the Agada mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the Manishtana. No, but but even beyond that, they were fascinated with the story as a story, which yes. I find fascinating as well. Yeah. It's a great story. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. which means uh, yeah. so, the goyim. <laughs> this is me and, and the rabbi. So yes, what, 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 our... Tell me, what is what is what in this rabbi inspire you? I, I think it's it's to me it's more of a a, a a reminder to to think of something and think about my my identity otherwise i get caught in what a lot of us do it's this vicious cycle of work 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 and work uh there's the family life that's the balance but it's more to me a reminder of other stuff of other values and and whether i do them or not it, it doesn't really matter but it's a reminder that there's something else i i can work 24 7. Uh, i love what i do uh, so it's it's hard for me to disconnect but to some extent, this is kind of a, that's why I have him here as a reminder of other things that I need to think about, uh, whether it's the sense of community and others and all of that. Um, not, ne not necessarily from a Judaism standpoint, but I think there's a lot of things that I love about Judaism. I'm just not familiar with other religions as, as good as I am with this, is the sense of others. Yes. And um, I it's think, scary. you know, uh, at my... My grandmother's uh, funeral, <laughs> which I only heard the recording and, and the rabbi said something. He said, like, um, it's a shame that a lot of people come to funerals, but very few people come to celebrations. 
Uh, it's funny how you always make time to go to somebody's funeral, but mm -hmm. you have plenty of excuses not to attend any other social events. Um, well, there's something I about think it should... that it's final, and then you cannot cover for it anymore. So uh, I think that yeah. you have to come because you won't be able to fix it later, you know? And it, I think it's a, they feel obligation, you know? I don't know, but- Yeah, they asked me, they asked me to write something for her funeral and, and I sent it over and I said, I think she would, she would be thrilled with her funeral and say something in lines of like, it was such a great event and so many people came. <laughs> right. She didn't see, and you know, you see many cultures where death is actually celebrated as dish. part of- She opened yeah. the dish like, Right. the rabbi and also don't forget you from everything i know about in from this hour you like sharing sharing your visions sharing your what you think is valuable uh, how to how to make people happy how yeah, to... i think it's it's quite what am i going to take all of this with me to where am i going to take it yeah, to? you know yeah, it's uh... right but also I think it's the heart of the kibbutz because it's a community and uh, when you grow up and, it, and it's, it's a good experience, you keep it with yourself and uh, you like to share it and to create good vibe for others. Yeah. And, it, it, and on the top of it, um, I think that the community, the north of Israel is going to gain. Yeah, it's going to be great. And by the way, somebody, except everything else, people can learn from you is actually we can all find something that can make us a peaceful. Like, you know, you took a picture, even if it was not known, something in his image does it for you. And we all can yeah. find something to, you know, we have all to search for something that will ease, you know, our, or, or, or will, you know, put in proportion our temper, our desires, our, you know, Whatever. So anyway, it's silly. Come on. You Leo, we need to come and, and <laughs> visit. I'm curious about the colors. Please. All I, Wait, really I will come with him. So be and careful. Please. With my mother. When, when do you open the academy in Israel? In October 2022. October 2022. <laughs> yeah. Come on. yeah. So we, we have a little bit ahead of us. We are finalizing curriculum working on designs and plans and oh, this, uh, is, this is great yeah, yeah. and, Fun, and getting fun. this and still getting it off the ground you know which is and going, uh, this as is a wonderful scenery it's yeah. really a wonderful place so where are they going to eat now that you did you took away their dining room no they don't. Uh, so that dining room in gonen was abandoned for yeah. over 10 years uh, yeah most most wow. places and uh isn't it ironic that this will open in a dining room. Is yes. it a closure of something? I don't know. Closure, yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> wow. Listen, really, that was so, yeah, that was very inspiring. It good. You. And uh, you really touched us and you didn't know us. Thank you. So that's why we, I, I'm, I'm going to come and take a class about uh, filmmaking. Yeah, I thought I will come to you, just, you know, talk to you. <laughs> But you but know, this CP, is... you have to come with gefilte fish. Yes. I don't know if you would like but it. I, but I do my gefilte fish. I don't, I don't buy Manishevit. My kids call it, time. my kids call it filtered fish. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> send them to me. Anyway, but I, you know, I'm not a great cook. Just you have to put some, some spice that will color it a little bit. It's so, oh, yes. it's so pale. Right, right. <laughs> so listen, this is really what Suzanne is all about. If you remember what I said in the beginning, you did, you did, you, you did open us to something new which actually inspired us, I'm sure, even, you know, me coming from, by the way, my mother was a great human being. She was fantastic, you know, but she just cooked like it was a soil of a shoe. What can I do? Uh, so listen, thank you so much. Listen, Tilly, we have to say goodbye. Thank you for inviting me. This was amazing. And see you all next week. All next week. Thank Thanks. you for coming. Bye. See you. Bye-bye. Stay well.